Hello there, my name's Martin Henley. This is the Effective Marketing YouTube channel. And if you've spent a second here, you will know that I'm on a mission to give you everything you need to be successful in your business. Now, as far as I know, the only way for you to be successful in your business is to be more effective with your sales and marketing. So not only am I here giving you everything I know about sales and marketing, I'm also pulling in anyone I can find with experience of sales and marketing that might be useful to you if you're looking to be more successful with your business. We also have the news here every other Wednesday, and we also review the very best and the very worst of marketing content on the internet. But today is talk marketing. And today's guest has marketing experience going back to 2006 when he was a direct marketing experience, uh, specialist. He has been running his own businesses since 2008. He is currently president of Business Rebel and CEO of Seven Tree Media and co-host of the Perspective podcast. In his LinkedIn professional headline, he describes himself as a customer experience visionary, a content creator, a marketing strategist, and growth hacker. Today's guest, all the way from Canada, is Devin Jones. Good evening, Devin. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Martin. It's only a pleasure. I'm really excited about this conversation. Because I've never I've never spoken to a customer experience visionary before, um, <laughs> so I understand that this is your um, this is going to be your special subject. So this is what we're going to talk about today: is customer experience and growth hacking, um, and I'm really excited to speak about those. But interestingly, you've got a drum kit sitting behind you, haven't you? Is that what you've got piled up there? A drum kit? I do. Okay, so that's cool. And I understand that you've got some background in music. And it's a little bit of a theme that runs through these conversations is that very often people who end up in marketing start out in some kind of much more creative endeavor, like music or comedy or acting or whatever it is. And I think that's interesting. The question I ask is, is that because marketing is performative? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've thrown you. You weren't expecting that question. So uh, think about it in terms of when I was a musician, my job was always to, I at least I thought, take micro emotions and then overanalyze them. <laughs> okay. So when you do that, you, you really have to dig into uh, you know, how someone thinks or how they uh, feel, um, more importantly, actually how they feel. And then you have to express that in some way. And so being a creative musically, I express that through my lyrics and through uh, the instrumentation. I play guitar and a little bit of piano and things like that, too. Um, and so you want somebody to feel something. I'll, I'll use this as an example. It's, uh, let's say, one o'clock in the morning, uh, on a hot summer day, just finished raining. Um, you were out all night with the love of your life and you stop at a convenience store and you grab a pop and then you go and you sit out on the curb and the, the smell of the wet concrete is in the air and you can hear the cars driving and other people's lives are going on. But none of that matters because you're with the one person that really matters to you. And so the whole world just kind of melts away and you enjoy these long and deep conversations about life and the future and, um, you know, some of your past traumas and things like that. And, and you really, for once in your life, feel truly connected to somebody. How do you take that and explain it to somebody poetically with four keys on a keyboard? You really got to know how to assemble a chord progression in a way that's going to evoke that emotion without any words being said. Now we take that same concept and that same idea and move it over into other places in our lives. Let's say you want, you have a watch that you sell. You could sell a watch by putting it on a shelf in a big box store and let people walk by and impulsively go, oh, that's nice and shiny. It's only 10 bucks, so I'm gonna grab it. Or you could spend some time you could have somebody handcraft each of the intricate pieces and put a watch together over a couple of months of time and then sell it for a hundred thousand dollars 
once. So there's all of these different concepts that uh, I, I don't know, had an innate sense for. And I, I kind of picked up on it right from when I was a child. Wow, that's a great answer. That's the best answer anyone's ever given to me for that question. Like, because I've come to this late, and I really know I've come to this late, this idea of psychographics. I don't know if you're familiar with this idea. Um, but that's kind of all of the psychology or all of the emotion that goes alongside, um, like, marketing decisions, like buying decisions, maybe. So I've always been a very, is the word practical obvious i don't know in my sales and marketing career i've just been about putting what i have to offer in front of the people who need it do you know what i mean and not particularly caring about why or how they need it so i have come really late to this idea of kind of psychographics or emotions and it's interesting um it's the maya angelo although it's not necessarily her who said it but she's credited with saying it like people will forget what you say they'll forget what you do they'll never forget the way you make them feel and this, I think, is really powerful. And if that's what you're saying, that's the best answer to that question that I've ever heard. What I think is, what, like the way I think about it is, is that you kind of have to keep the show going until it's actually working. Do you know what I mean? So you're on there doing like the tap and the jazz hands, like keeping everyone happy until actually the results start to kick in. That's the way. So I think it's performative on a number of levels. Yours is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, and, and the thing is, is as new mediums come out, the creativity compounds, it just gets more and more interesting because, you know, sure, I can strum a few notes on a guitar. That's just one piece of it. Well, what if I write some lyrics on a piece of paper? Well, there's two pieces, but they don't necessarily go together just like that. So somebody has to perform the, the lyrics now, and I can maybe I'll play the guitar and sing at the same time. And that's really great. But now how am I going to share this with the world? Well, now I got to get a camera and a good microphone and I got to make a video and then I got to put that where, right? And as you continue to, to uh, stack these things, the, the more complex it gets. And this is why I think most small businesses, startups, um, and even medium-sized businesses really struggle with that in terms of uh, getting results is because once you start stacking those multi-talent uh, elements, uh, it becomes impossible for somebody to get past something. For example, well, I have a commercial that I want to put on Facebook, um, but I don't have any music. So where do I start with that? I can't write music. And so a, a problem exists and a solution is born. And now there exists uh, a YouTube audio library where you can get royalty free music. The music's overplayed. And uh, I'm sure if you went through it, you'd recognize the first hundred songs because they've all been used before. And, and then, uh, more platforms existed to solve that problem like epidemic sound where you can go and have a subscription you can download unlimited music and use it all over the place but but it's all of these little elements and when you put them together yes very much performative but also uh, because of technology it's become scientific and I think that that's the most interesting part about how marketing has evolved over the ages Wow. And even like the very recent ages, like the last 15 years, you know, everything you're talking about now has become available in the last 15 years. And it astounds me. When I was 15, I had a careers meeting with a teacher in my school. And she said, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be on the TV. I'd like audition for parts on TV and stuff as well. So it wasn't the most outlandish thing ever. And she was like, oh, OK, well, there's a factory in the industrial estate where they make TVs. So maybe you could go and work there and you might work your way up. Do you know what I mean? I imagine how many people are working in this factory who thought they were going to be, I don't know, talk show hosts and they're putting TVs in boxes. Um, yeah. But the point is now is that we're on TV right now. Do you know what I mean? People will be watching this on their actual televisions. Um, so, yeah, that fascinates me as well. All those barriers have been removed. And like you say, like... The, the, the color grading things are just amazing now and really accessible. The music is accessible. People are accessible. You know, this is, for me, the most exciting thing that's going on with digitization. And there is a cost to it, um, but we don't need to speak about that today because I bore people with that too much of the time. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, 
you're right it's that's the best example it's like artists are in the in the business of communicating those emotions and the best yes. marketers are in the business of communicating emotions i love it i, I watched the um i did a reaction to steve jobs's um the um crazy ones um ad this week and what was interesting to me is like he was talking about it like it was the presentation of when he presented the ad and where he started was like we're living in a crazy world you know it's too busy it's too much going on we're not going to get the chance to get people to remember very much about us so we have to be really careful about what we communicate to people about us because that might be all it is and but that's what music is isn't it if you think about your base your your favorite music or the most emotive music you just go to the very best bit or the very most um touching bit great answer brother i've got new hope for this new found hope for this conversation okay yes. so but we're not here to talk about music necessarily we're talked about we're talked about we're here to talk about the sweet sweet music of marketing maybe um and your specialist subjects so as you know there's only five questions and um, the questions are, how are you qualified to talk to us about customer experience and growth hacking? Um, who do you work with? How do you add value to their lives? Um, what is your recommendation for people who want to get better at customer experience or growth hacking? What do you recommend people read? And who can you throw under the bus who might endure to have a conversation like this with me? So let's start at the beginning. How are you, ex how are you qualified to talk to us about customer experience and growth hacking? Well, Martin... The truth is, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> the, the only thing, uh, I guess, that qualifies me to be uh, somebody who talks about this is the fact that I've been a customer. I've been a customer a million times. And you know what? I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And I don't think I'm unusual. I don't think I'm anybody special. I don't think I'm different than many folks out there. Uh, I think I've just been able to identify it and uh, explain it or, or uh, unpack it in a way that makes sense for people who are still too close to their painting to see the masterpiece. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Good. And then how does this translate into you making a living doing this? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, so Full disclosure, I, I dropped out of high school, grade 11. Um, I went to a uh, high school in a small town, and there was not a lot of promise there. Um, uh, your story about uh, your your teacher asking um, what you want to be when you grow up, I, I did the same thing to my, uh, to my girlfriend's son, who at the time was 13, and his answer was, was so profound. I still to this day, I talk about it to anybody I can. He said, I don't know what all the jobs are. And I wish I had that frame back when I was in the position to make decisions for myself. But I knew that what I was doing was not getting me to where I wanted to be. I knew that I wasn't going to build things. Um, as creative as I am, and as much as I enjoy, you know, uh, a Sunday afternoon with my dad on the farm, building a shed, uh, it was not a passion of mine. It did not make me excited or happy to wake up in the morning. It was not my thing. I'm more of a creative person. And, and so I was drawn to these other things. So my dad gave me uh, probably the best advice I've ever gotten in my entire life. He said, well, uh, either get your shit together and get your diploma or go out into the real world and figure out what it is you want to do. So I opted for the second choice. And uh, I found myself in the University of uh, hard knocks and uh, had about 38 different jobs before I realized that I was unemployable and I needed to do something more productive with my time uh, than change oil or stock shelves or clean cars. Um, I, I needed to do something. So uh, I had a conversation with my dad. I said, listen, um, I'm really good at photography and I know that real estate agents need how uh, the houses that they're selling, they need pictures taken of them. So could you introduce me to a couple of people you know? And before I knew it, my dad was uh, out there making calls and 
setting up appointments and me and him started up my first official business that I was a part of. So we did, we ended up doing real estate photography, virtual tours. Um, I, I branched into other real estate services like, uh, measurement verifications and things like that. And really, uh, learned how marketing worked for the real estate world. And it was a, general curiosity of mine uh, as I was growing up, human psychology, I s suffered from a myriad of mental illnesses, depression and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And I really just wanted to understand myself. That was all I endeavored to do when I fell down that rabbit hole. But I started reading a lot of self-help books and uh, personal development books. And that led into a, a book I read called Trust Me, I'm Lying by uh, Ryan Holiday, which really blew my mind and the way uh, media manipulation works and how that ties into marketing and um, a number of other things. I was, this is something that I really want to do. I really want to pursue this. And so uh, I started looking more intentionally at different online marketing courses and things like that. I was an in Indiepreneur and Jump Cut and uh, Funnel University, Russell Brunson and Jim Stewart. They had a, um, a, a lot of different things that you could learn from them. And um all of that I needed to take and put somewhere where it made sense. So I started with my own music career and uh, I did my own thing. I helped a couple of musicians and, and we worked on developing brand and developing the artists. And then I realized that there was no money to be made there because a lot of the artists that are in the industry aren't making any money doing what they're doing. And, and so they can't really invest into it in any way because they're also starving artists like I was. Uh, so I was like, okay, let's try this in the business world. My ex-wife was uh, a tattoo artist and I said, well, hey, why don't we set up a, a studio in the house and I'll run some ads and just see if we can't get some customers. Um, at $10 a day, uh, I ran a $100 gift card ad and <laughs> in about three days, uh, we had so many people inquire um, and, and book into her studio that I was like, I must be onto something here. And so we just, we kept the train running and before I knew it, we were getting three, four, five leads a day. She was turning those into one or two clients a day and uh, I was off to the races. I had uh, a testimonial that I could use and I started looking for more customers and um, somewhere along the way, I coined the term a sustainable content model and realized that the way to build a healthy brand was to first show people that you were good at what you do. And so that's how I helped my, uh, my ex-wife get her clients was I showed them how good she was. And they just, obviously they wanted to, uh, you know, have her do artwork on their body. And, and then I was like, okay, well, where else can this work? And, um, from the transferable skills that I learned as a musician, um, I, started dabbling in the world of creating videos, music videos at first, but then it was like, well, what else can I do? And then it was podcasting and uh, reality TV type stuff where we you know, created a couple of different YouTube channels and that became the offer. That became the thing. I went to as many businesses as I possibly could to try and sell this idea of a sustainable content model to them. And I believe I was just a little ahead of my time. It didn't catch on. So we ended up just doing a little bit of social media management and marketing for some small budget businesses. And uh, eventually, um, my sustainable content started taking off in a real way everywhere else in the business world in the form of what you and I are doing right now, podcasting. So I was like, well, I'm an audio engineer already. I do all the music and sound recording for artists um, you know, locally here in town. Um, I know how to do video stuff. I've made dozens of music videos. I'm very well familiar with that. So what if I combine the two and turn that into a brand for people? And I combine my photography and graphic design and all those other things into it. And now I serve a number of customers doing, um, full suite, uh, podcast production, um, and content distribution and marketing. And I help them grow their brands and, uh, get customers as a result and, and monetize, add different, you know, uh, revenue streams to their existing business that, you know, they otherwise couldn't have done in the past. So uh, it's been a long and rocky road, but here we are now. And uh, I think the thing that qualifies me to do it is just that I've done it for so long 
uh, at such a high level that um, I know the tricks of the trade. I know the ins and outs. I know how to uh, do things faster and easier than most people in the space know. Cool. And I think that's really important. I think that's really important is because it's so easy to get sidetracked. You know, it's so easy. Like there are a million people who want a little piece of you. Do you know what I mean? So it's so easy to get pulled in the wrong direction. So knowing how things actually work, I think is really important. And also having done it and made mistakes is really important. That kind of empowers you to, to steer people on a, on a more efficient course. Okay, cool. So this thing about growth hacking, I think you need to explain to us what growth hacking actually is. Okay, so check this out. We um, Growth hacking, I think, is, is just breaking the system uh, in, in a way that benefits as many possible people uh, and simultaneously doesn't destroy your bank account. I know from dealing with a lot of like small businesses, they only have a few hundred bucks kicking around extra after they, you know, they make a profit, they, they got to pay for their own bills and stuff like that. And sure, that's good and all, but th there's no room for them to grow because they are a, they have too much time allocated to serving their business. Uh, B um, there's a lot of, maybe there's a lot of overhead in their business or whatever, and they can't really afford to do much more. So trying to, you know, make your business blow up on a, two or $300 a month budget is just seemingly impossible. So how do you make that $200 work harder? Uh, it could be as simple as, and I, I use this for, for musicians because it's a really easy example to use. Right now for me, if I wanted to grow a fan base for my, uh, my artist brand, I could make a song and then I'll make a music video. I take that music video, I put it on YouTube and then I run some Google ads to have as many people see that video as possible. And a small percentage of people that see that video uh, are going to like it. And then they're going to engage with it in some way, but then they're going to forget about it. And then what? Well, I got to run a secondary campaign that goes back to that group of people and asks them to go do something a little bit more meaningful, like stream that song on Spotify or subscribe to my YouTube channel, or maybe share it with a friend if they really like the song. And you know, hopefully that, that does something to kind of tangibly or measurably grow my audience. And then there's a third layer to it where I have some t-shirts that I have in my online web store that I got to sell to that audience of people so that I can make a living because I'm not making any money on the views. I'm sure anybody can do a quick Google search and figure out how much money you make uh, on YouTube streaming revenue. And it's not very much until you're in the top tier. If you let, let's see, if you have a million views on a video, you can make 1500 bucks, but that's not enough. How long did it take you to get to that million views? You got to factor that in. So you, you're not really making a lot. So now I got to run a third level of ads to get people to buy my t-shirt who have liked and subscribed to my channel after I've made them like, and subscribe to my channel after they saw the video and enjoyed 75% of it. So it gets really, really complicated and now scientific. Yes. Are there elements along the way that we can test and measure to make sure that all the you know pieces are falling into place? Absolutely. Um, but it, the budget, right? It costs a lot of money to be able to do that. And unless you can sustain that with some current income, um, it's a real quick way to land on your face and give up. So growth hacking is where we make that $200 or $300 or $500 go a little bit further. So I'll use this as an example. Let's say I have all in, I've saved $1,000 and I'm ready to market my next hit. What I would do is I would go to as many people as I can until I can find somebody who does dancing. And I would ask them to do a cool little dance, 20 seconds, just choreograph something and I'm going to just shoot it on my phone. And I'm not going to do anything special. I'm just going to shoot it on my phone and then I'm going to take that video and I'm going to run it with a headline that says, can you create a better dance than this? I'm hosting a contest and I'm going to give away a free vacation to anybody who can do a better dance than this. It's only going to run for 30 days. At the end of it, I'm going to select somebody who did the best dance and I'm going to give you a free vacation. Now I go to 
Travelocity or maybe a local travel agent or something like that. And I get them to give me a $500 travel voucher. And then in the description, I'm going to say that free vacation has been uh, provided by so-and-so. Now the exchange for them is they get all the exposure on the uh, ad that I'm running to the group of people that I'm running it to. So now I go to Facebook or YouTube or anywhere and I select people who have an interest in dancing and I run an ad, this ad to them. I spend the other $500 that I have to that for that campaign. Oh, sorry. If I have to buy the, the travel voucher myself, I will. Uh, for that $500, but hopefully I can get it for free. So I spend $500 to $1,000 on a video view campaign. I get this in front of 10,000 people whose interests are to dance. And hopefully one of those uh, 10 or 20,000 people are a professional dancer or have a dance audience in their own little niche world of 100, 200 or 300,000. They do the dance. They upload it on their account. My song just got uploaded there now anybody that's on that account that sees them dancing they're also going to try to participate in this contest to win and and now i've engineered a level of virality into this because i've baked in some incentive for people to participate on top of that i've created a little bit of community around me and it can now become something that i can sustain over a longer period. So now I work my butt off for another couple of months. I save up another thousand bucks. I make another song that is, you know, uh, that fits in the genre of danceable. And I continue this cycle. And if I can do that repeatedly for 12 months, I guarantee you, I would have a fan base of millions of people just because of that being able to hack that system. So that's growth hacking. That's being able to make your dollars go a little bit farther, but as you do that, you cook in as many elements as you possibly can to uh, to attach affinity to your brand. Does that make sense? It really does make sense. Yeah, it really, really does make sense. But I've got another thing going on. What you're going to learn about me is I've got a head full of issues, man. So um, <laughs> it gets challenging sometimes. Okay, so it yeah. makes 100% perfect sense. Um, if your audience are dancers... So how do you then, like, so you've got an audience now of millions. I want to talk about this audience thing. I'm going to have to make notes. Um, I want to talk about this audience thing. So now you've got an audience of millions. How do you then leverage that to pay the bills? Once you've established a group of people that know, like, and trust you, it's simply a matter of letting them know that, you, that there is a way that they can support you. So it starts with really, really simple stuff like, yeah, I just created a new t-shirt and I put it in my store. And if you like the design, go buy one. I don't have to convince anybody. They already know, like, and trust me. And, and they know that uh, to sustain my business, I can sell them a t-shirt and, and, and they'll buy it. But further to that, uh, hey, so-and-so in such and such city, I'm on tour right now and I'm coming to your city. And if you want to join me for a concert, uh, it's going to be at this venue. And I pick a venue of maybe a thousand people maximum. It doesn't have to be that much for this to be sustainable. In fact, if you were going to a bar that had a capacity of a hundred people and you charge $35 for the ticket, you just made $3,500. So that covers your travel, you know, your gas and expenses to get to where you're going, a little bit of your food and a hotel night stay at that location that you're on in your tour. So let's say that's $1,000 because you're living lavishly. You still made $3,000 on that stop. So you can put some money, save it. You can uh, put some money on your bills and all that other stuff. And, and we haven't, that's not even the tip of the iceberg because there's a number of other really great ways you can monetize that brand. You can, uh, you know, get the streaming revenue from Spotify or Apple or Amazon Music or anywhere where your music's played. Arguably, it's not going to be a lot, but it will be enough that if you have an audience of a million people listening to you on Spotify, your rent, your utilities, your car payments, your insurance, your groceries, it's covered. That's all, that's all you'll need to make those bills paid. So anything you do on top of that is just increasing your, your monthly income, right? Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, so this is, we are talking about now growth hacking for content producers like musicians or video makers or whoever they might be. 
Okay, cool. Right. So that nullifies my next question, but I want to ask the, the next question anyway, because um, I did a whole spiel. Like I was running my business properly from 2005 to like 2014. I was a marketing agency. I wanted to have customers. I was out speaking and we were marketing ourselves. We were marketing them. And when social media came along, what I was telling people, I was telling them a lot of stuff. I'm a little bit embarrassed that I was such a salesperson for Mark Zuckerberg and whoever else. But what I was telling people, but, both, <laughs> <laughs> but at the time it was true. It's like literally what social media did up until that time, like a proportion of your budget would go to buying the space in the magazine, on the TV station, on the radio station, whatever it was. And what I was telling people, because I came from media, so I, this is the way I understood it. What I was telling people is the space is now free. So basically, the currency, is, the currency is creativity. You can spend all of that money now on creating really cool things. Um, so that was true. And I was telling people the opportunity now is to take a step closer to your market and step in the sh into the shoes of the media. So previously, there was you, there was the media, there was your market. So the media was like your gateway to the market. And social media essentially made that free and we know what happened is they sold out to, to wall street they have to please their shareholders you know blah 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 that's the way it's gone um what's the point of this so i was telling people step one in social media is to build an audience but i wasn't telling performers creators musicians i was telling businesses the issue with this is that I sp I've spoken, the only person I've spoken to twice on this show is uh, a guy called Barnaby Winter. He's an absolute genius, an absolute genius. And he is essentially, his business is called The Brand Bucket, but he is essentially the brand guy, I think, in the UK. And he's behind all sorts of household names. But what he'll tell you is that they weren't household names until he got involved. His point is, sorry, this is the world's longest question. His point is, you don't need an audience. You just need the people who are going to buy from you to know. And he describes it as the fraud of the broadcast media that they've, um, they've convinced businesses that everybody needs to know about them. Do you see what I'm saying? And when yes. that's grossly inefficient, so you don't need to advertise on national television you don't need to advertise on national um, um, radio or newspapers or any of those things. You just, like he says to me, literally, if you only need 10 customers a month, you only need 10 people on your website a month. As long as you've got exactly the thing that they want, then they will buy it. There is a question somewhere in our future, Devin. <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> to find it. So the question is, this growth hacking, 100%, if it's a performer, if it's a, um, yeah, if it's a performer, if it's a creator, if it's a musician, then 100%, what well, do they even need audience? That's the question. Do, do businesses really need audience? That's the question I have for you. This, this is awesome. So the, the way that I would explain it, and there's a difference between, um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch his name. What was the other guy's name? Barnaby Winter. Mr. Winter, uh, the way that he has framed it is, at least if I'm understanding it correctly, and I, I think that he's a brilliant guy if, if, he, if all the work that he's done has achieved the results that he's gotten. So I'm not uh, discounting the work that he's done. What I will add to that is, if you go to the news or you go to the radio station or you go to the magazine or nowadays you go to facebook instagram TikTok, youtube whatever um what's happening if you're solely just running ads is you're going to other water coolers where conversations are being had and and then you're interrupting that conversation with something now my argument is is that it would be more beneficial if you became the water cooler. If your brand was the water cooler and everybody was having those conversations around your brand, then you wouldn't have to go anywhere because they would already be there. And when they need water, guess what happens? 
they they can get it when they need it. So, and and here's an here's another really great way to kind of tie this analogy together, right? If if you're having a conversation, it's you three, four, five your friends. If the conversation is going really really well, and then some weirdo shows up. And it's like, hey, guys, did you know you can make $5 million by doing cryptocurrency? And he just starts talking about some random stuff that you're... How does that make you guys feel, right? Being that you are already having this conversation and then some weird dude just kind of... That's what in-stream ads are. That's what, like, when I'm watching something on Facebook or YouTube or something, right? And I'm, I'm there for a very specific reason. For example, uh, Peter McKinnon. Shout out Peter McKinnon. He's an incredible creator. Uh teaches people how to do uh, photography and videography very, very well. In the middle of his comp, he's telling me some stuff. I'm trying to learn this. And then all of a sudden, Russell Brunson pops up for 15 seconds and tries to sell me on the idea that funnels are, you know, the new web page. And although Russell's probably right, and that attention is great for him to have, it's frustrating and annoying and angering. And it lowers my like for him and for his brand. And Facebook figured this out really quickly because they started doing it on, on Facebook videos. You'd be watching a video and then halfway through that little video, it's a 30 second meme. I'm waiting. And then 15 seconds into it, I'm getting an in-stream ad and I'm like, no, I'm done. I would close Facebook and, and leave it. And I wouldn't come back to that platform. And that, that happened, I think on mass because they stopped having that as an ad product. So these social media platforms are picking up on it and they're understanding it that us as content consumers behave in a certain way. But I would argue that businesses need to figure that out sooner than later because eventually they're not going to be able to reach their customers. And you, and we're seeing this happen with big brands and big corporations being so completely out of touch with the general population. And of this cancel culture was born where a brand would do something so meaningless <laughs> and then they would be talked about at somebody else's water cooler. And and that's no good for a brand. That's no good for anybody because that brand serves people to some degree. I think I, I would think that there's a reason why, uh, you know, marble cheese is still a thing because people like it. They want it. They want to buy the black diamond cheese. I don't know what brands of cheese you have where you're at, but <laughs> But if we don't they have, said we, something wrong and now people are talking about them on Twitter and they're losing customers because of it, something's wrong there. There's a disconnect between them and their customers. And, you know, my job is to kind of recreate that connection with people by helping them build their own water cooler and then attracting people to it. Does that make sense? 100% it makes sense. So are you saying you don't want your brand to be the weird guy that crashes the party? That's right. Could you say that? Because then we can have that as the title of this video. Yeah. Well, you don't want your brand to be the weird guy that crashes the party. Cool. That's excellent. That's our title. Good. Okay. So this isn't over. <laughs> now you have to sustain that water cooler environment. This is what I'm saying. And this yes. is what Barnaby would say is that's not your business. Your business is providing whatever it is you provide. So, so handily in your analogy, you are providing water, but I'm not providing water. I'm providing, what am I providing? Um, pencil sharpeners. But now I have to create a water cooler environment too, and I have to maintain that, and that's not my business. Another one of my friends who um, teaches digital marketing, he talks about the... Um, social media publishing swindle where basically right. and it's not exclusive to social media it's google it's facebook it's instagram it's, it, it's all of them it's google but what they've managed to do is convince us all arguably uh, we've already argued the other side of this so this is where it gets a bit meta maybe but basically they've convinced us all that we need to be creating content for them all the time so facebook has two billion contributors and never pays any of them a cent. Although I think they might, you might be able to monetize some Facebook content now, finally. But they've sustained themselves for this amount of time by having people write exactly what you want to know about, which is them. Do you know what I mean? They're your friends. And they, they've created all of this content, um, but, but Facebook have never paid a penny for it. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a conundrum. It, the paradox, as it were, is that uh, people go where things demand our attention. And the attention used to be on the radio. The radio was replaced by the television. Uh, the television was replaced by your computer screen, which was replaced by your cell phone, which is now being replaced by a VR headset, which will be replaced with Neuralink chips that Elon Musk is working on. All of the while, uh, the way that it ha the way that it evolves changes just a little bit, but the same underlying unwritten rules apply. And it used to be that you could listen to the radio. And, uh, and there would be really decent programming on there. There would be music that you want to listen to. There would be talk shows. There would be stories with sound effects and stuff. Like, I don't know how far back you want to go, but, but, but really entertaining things used to exist on the radio. But then when you put a moving picture to it, it just that demanded more of our attention. And so we started watching that. But the unwritten rule has always been there in that the content still has to be good, still has to be something that we want to see or else people aren't going to be there. And so here's the, um, the, the, the dichotomy is there are people out there who understand the underlying principles of how our brain works and can create for those mediums in a way that will draw us to it. And at first it starts with stories. Once upon a time, there was a thing and uh, every day, this is how it was until one day, some crazy thing happened. And then because of that, they did something and it made it worse. And then because of that, they did something and it made it even more worse until finally some magic bullet solution showed up and everybody lived happily ever after. This is the Marvel framework that they have so uh, incredibly encapsulated. But if you take that same idea and you just look, just look everywhere you go that story framework is in play and it is being used to draw you in. You're being told a story and you want to hear the story. Our brain naturally wants to close a loop. So if there's a really good hook at the beginning, then your brain's naturally going to close that loop. Now it was cool when that was in a very small environment of creative people who knew how to do it very well. TV commercials weren't bad until they became more often than the actual TV show that you were watching. And then they had to kind of sort of dial it back and they figured out this really happy medium of 22 minutes of programming and eight minutes of commercials is okay for people. Then we take this same principle, and we bring it online and every Tom, Dick and Harry who could press a few keys and take a photo decided that they were a marketing genius and started marketing and they ruined it. Now the marketing's not good. It's just a bunch of people doing low budget flyers on social media and people hate that. They don't want it. They, and that's why people don't engage with it is because it's dumb. It's not useful. Now, arguably, if you dive down into it and you are very, very good with your targeting, you're very, very good with creating an offer that's so, so good that people feel stupid saying no, maybe you might luck out and have a really strong winning campaign, but that doesn't, and I know you know this just as much as I do, that doesn't happen very often. It's not very often that you hit a home run on your first swing. Sometimes you got to swing a few times and that's now becomes the dilemma of a marketer is, is that uh, you go out to a, a business, you say, Hey, look, I, I know this stuff about your industry and I can help you solve this problem of getting customers. And, and so you try some things out and at first it doesn't work. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm not happy with you because you didn't get results. And I already spent $1,500 with you. And then they move on and they find somebody else who's going to repeat that until they're like, oh, all marketers are garbage. They don't know what they're doing, yada, yada, yada. And it's mostly because we keep breaking these unwritten rules. And uh, I have found that it has become way easier for me to do my job when I don't listen to my clients. <laughs> Well, we want to run a campaign that's like this and it does that. And it, well, why? What results have you seen it get? Is it just something that you saw when you were scrolling? Did you actually click on it? Did you actually purchase that thing? Or is it just what your competition is doing? And so you feel like you got to do the same thing. And so this is why it becomes really important to have somebody like me uh, step in to fill that void because I am a creative. I understand those underlying principles of human behavior and storytelling and those micro emotions that you really got to uh, 
trigger for somebody to make a buying decision or to develop some level of brand affinity with you? I, I don't know. I, I tend to ramble here, so I hope I answered the question. No, uh, you do know, and you did answer the question, and it's not a conundrum because actually um, if – it is more cost if if it is as cost effective to maintain this environment around the water cooler to be the place where people are hanging out then it doesn't matter that's fine and actually maintaining that environment is a lot of fun do you know what i mean you get to be creative you get to meet people and network with people and come up with interesting ways of delivering value and communicating value and doing all of those things and i think what you said earlier is absolutely right what I tell people is all you need to do if you want to be a successful business is deliver value and evidence delivering that value and communicate that evidence to other people that you could be delivering value to. You know, so there's nothing very difficult in this. And the thing is, I think Barnaby isn't a million miles away from us. And he also does growth hacking, although he wouldn't explain it like that. And I can't remember exactly what he's talking about, but he was talking to me about uh, a paid a Google ad campaign where they were selling a speaker, but it was a really high end expensive speaker. So he's like, well, who can afford to buy this? And then it was, it might've been Ferrari um, owners. And then, so the keywords they targeted weren't anything to do with speakers. It was to do with um, Ferraris. And it was to do with the fact that the, part of the Ferrari brand is this particular note that the engine hits when it hits a particular number of revs and a particular, do you know what I mean? And it's like, and yeah. so he did it. And, and he was like, you know, how many people are searching for Ferrari keywords? It might have been, I don't know what the exact keyword was. It kind of been Ferrari because it's got every eight-year-old boy on the planet and that wasn't his market. <laughs> but it was whatever it was. And he ended up with 10 people on this page and eight of these people bought these speakers and it all happened within like two days. So he is growth hacking. He is like breaking the thing and coming with an entirely different logic. The other thing that I 100% agree with you is that you can't be listening to clients. That's insane. <laughs> they haven't got a clue. That's why you're there. Um, yeah. But the frustration there, but this is a whole other thread probably. The frustration there is that for me, clients don't know anything. The first time you meet them, you blow their mind with the possibilities. And then the second time they go, you go, they know absolutely everything about it. And they only want particularly this one thing that isn't necessarily going to be effective. That's why I don't have clients anymore. Um, <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> somebody, I commented on a LinkedIn thing the other day. I think I'm going to spend 10 minutes like commenting on LinkedIn a day. I think I want to build that into my little program because somebody said, oh, here's your guide to audience building. And I commented like, what are we entertainers now? Do you know what I mean? Because there is something in this that that's um, riling me. There is something in this that's riling me that and it, but it's not even difficult if it is actually cost effective to do that. And it's good fun to do that to maintain this water cooler environment then clearly that's a, that's a good idea for businesses. And I think well, you know, I'd, I'd like to just unpack that for a second, because I, I think that you are speaking to um, a lot of people who share that same um, mentality. And this is what I would this is what I would counter it with just to put it into perspective. Right now, any company uh, that's doing well enough to have employees has at least one of those employees that they're paying for who is in charge of doing marketing. Now, here is where the, the real dilemma exists is that they're doing marketing based on what the owner or the CEO or the president have instructed them to do. And so they're not really, first of all, deploying their own creative skills in you know, most situations. They're just doing what they're told to do and they just so happen to know where all the buttons are. And so that's why they're in that position. I, I can't tell you how many positions I've interviewed for uh, uh, in my way back when I was like, I'm never, I can't make my company work. I'm going to go pro broke and end up homeless. So I applied for a couple of jobs and yeah, they, they really just want a monkey with a hat who can push buttons. And that's, that's a problem for me because you're, you're not, you're not solving the issue of 
communicating creatively with the audience of people that you are meant to serve. So if you're spending, um, what, I don't know what a good wage is for a marketer these days. If you hired them to be employed at your business at 25 or 30 bucks an hour, and what are they going to do? They're going to come in and they're going to clock eight or 10 hours a day for at least 20 days out of that month. And, and so they've racked up this bill of three or $4,000 plus you probably, you got to add in some benefits and taxes and other things. And so before you know it, you're spending $5,000 on somebody who is going to push buttons for you based on your orders. And then when it doesn't work, you fire that person you and you continue down that cycle, hoping or praying that it's going to change something. The, the reality is, is, uh, and I'll use the pencil sharpener uh, example. I, I have a pencil sharpener and I can push buttons. I can go online and I can put a listing up on Facebook and I can sell it to somebody and it'll sell. Depends on how long it takes. And if people are actually searching for that in that environment, hopefully it happens. I can skip all of that and I can spend a few hundred bucks and I can market pencils to teachers. Uh, sorry, pencil sharpeners to teachers. I pick people whose jobs are teachers and, and hope that they buy it. But, you know, after I've saturated that market and gone through all the teachers that are going to buy it, what do I got to do? I got to start all over again. And I, my next year, we developed a brand new way that the pencil sharpener sharpens pencils and it's three times more efficient. Well, I'm going to go back to those teachers and try to sell it to them, but they already got it. They don't need another one that's two or three times faster. So now what? Now I got to find somebody else to sell the pencil sharpeners to. See, the thing is, is that if I had a community of teachers around me and I was the water cooler and, and I was creating something that was valuable for that whole group of people, not only A, would I be able to continually provide pencil sharpeners, they one breaks, I can sell, we, we upgraded the color. Oh, hey, by the way, we got it in pink now if you want it. And some people are going to come and buy it just because that community is competing to have the latest and greatest and coolest thing. And, and then there's going to be some early adopters for new technology. But here's what's even cooler about it is I have a direct line. I am tapping the phones. I have a direct line to the problems with my pencil sharpeners, right? Oh, they don't like the ergonomics of the handle. It hurts. How do I put a motor in so they don't got to turn it anymore? Because I know exactly what the problem is that they're having. I can fix it. Oh, they're talking about my competition and how they just did this thing. Well, how can I get in front of that? I have this group of people that are my army now that are working for me. And so the investment pays itself off over time. And, and sure, you could have the perspective of dance monkey dance. But you could also have the perspective of I'm building a community of people. And in all of that analogy, uh, can you think of one brand who has done that really well over the last two decades? Who seemingly is a cult of people? <laughs> You mean Apple? Do you mean Apple? That's Apple for you right there. Yeah, yeah. So they have the, become the water cooler and they and they create their own content but they but they leverage other brands too because they can do that. So it's not an it's not an either or situation. It's an and situation. But you got to put the cart before the horse. You got to do the the hard work of, you know, figuring out who your customers are and how to reach them and what kind of content is going to serve them best because a podcast isn't going to work for everybody. And this is part of my sustainable content model uh, is there are 14 different types of content based value that you can create that historically have has worked for major brands since the beginning of time in terms of content goes. This goes back all the way to 1895 when John Deere, the, the tractor company, created a magazine called The Furrow. And they didn't just advertise all the great things about John Deere. What they did was they created a magazine that helped other farmers figure out how to do farming better. So they had writers and they had other products come in and advocate for, you know, technology advancement and more conversations were had around all of these cool ideas. And uh, it parabolically changed the way agriculture works and the furrow still exists today. And if a billion dollar tractor company can do a magazine, I think that the hairstylist down the road can set up a tripod on their phone and do a time lapse of them doing an amazing haircut and then upload it on TikTok and then use TikTok's 
cool music to make it 5% better. Yeah, or 30% better. See, the thing right. is, the thing is, <clears throat> is that people don't understand marketing. Okay, so let's Fair. go let's go back a little bit. People don't understand business. People don't understand that being in business is an exercise in having customers profitably. That's what it is. And marketing is about having those customers. So people think then, so, so most people don't get business and they don't get marketing. They don't get that they should be marketing in their business. And then when they start to get marketing, what they think is that marketing is about foisting their products on people. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm yeah. absolutely 100% selling this thing and I'm going to sell it to as many people as I possibly can. Because what they really don't understand that marketing is actually about what you're talking about, which is understanding the market, developing products that meet the, the needs and wants of that market, and putting that into the cycle, you know, continuously, um, you know, get landing those products, delivering the value, evidencing the value, dropping that evidence on prospective new people. So you're convincing me, you're convincing me 100%. So the other thing that we want to talk about, so that's growth hacking. That's about how you get an audience around you as quickly and cost effectively as possible. I dig that. Let's talk about customer experience. Because, oh, this is... what's that? I said, this is a great, a great conversation to have. But, but carry, but carry on. Where, where, are you, where are you leading me? <laughs> well, because I, here's my issue with customer experience is that I'm guessing in Canada, what will happen is you will call your bank and they will, the message will be, please hold. We are experiencing an unexpectedly high level of calls. Um, and we will have a operator with you in 12 minutes. Maybe something like that, some variation on that. Now, I've yeah. been hearing that message every time I call my bank for 15 years. So I know that these are data-driven businesses. And I know that they know exactly what the call volumes are, exactly what the staffing levels need to be to meet those, those call levels. But what they're doing is they are, what they're doing is they're like riding that line um, perfectly where it's as profitable as it needs to be at the expense of customer service, of cus good customer experience. So basically, maybe they've worked out that actually you will sit there and listen to the world's worst music for 12 minutes to get through. And then you'll be in a bad mood and the customer service representative will be in a bad mood because they've only been dealing with people in a bad mood all day already. Um, but you won't actually leave. So my issue, <laughs> I've, I've warned you I've got issues, is that it seems like it's one rule for us and one rule for other people, i.e. corporations. Small businesses really want to deliver the very best in customer experience Corporations don't give a shit. I shared that opinion so much until I read a book called Persuasion. Uh, Robert Cialdini, I think, wrote it. Um, and it, it's an exploration of the psychology behind how brands communicate with us. So... I got a really great example here that I'm going to tie into just after I, because I, I really wanted to actually touch on the, the call waiting thing. So it's actually not that the big brands don't care about us. It's that they have way too much time and resources and money and they figure things out that we would have never thought about. For example, why do they put you on hold for an extra three minutes and 48 seconds? So you calm down. What they found is, is that when you have an immediate problem, a problem so dire that you have to call them on the phone, uh, people would, if they answered right away, people are raging. They're just losing their minds. So they tested this. Well, let's say we put them on hold for one minute. See what happens. 
oh, the number of uh, customer complaints went down by 5%. So how long do we got to keep them on the phone now until they get more angry again, right? Because we got to find the happy medium somewhere right in the middle where we're not making them wait too long, but we do have to make them wait so they will cool down. Now, here's what's even cooler. Can we split test music? Let's put some soft jazz and let's put some pop and and half the callers will get soft jazz, half the callers are pop music and then we'll figure out which of these songs calms people down another 5 or 10 or 15% so that when they do finally get the operator on the other line, they're like, hey, yeah, so, uh, you know, I had this issue and they're, and they're less heated. They, they, they have that less of that heat of the moment emotion. And that is just insane for me to even think that they are thinking about how to serve us to that degree. Take this to, to the other story here. There was a furniture company selling furniture online and uh, they split tested two different landing pages um, and it was like a, a welcome screen. And on that welcome screen, you had to press a button to go in and actually see the furniture. But on the welcome screen, they put um, a picture of like stacks of coins and some pennies and money and things like that. And they said, welcome to this furniture store. Click here to enter. And then you would enter it. On the other group, they put a picture of just some clouds, some really nice, light, fluffy clouds in a blue sky. <clears throat> what they found was, once people entered the store, the group that saw the pennies and the money and the stacks of coins sorted the products more often by price than anything else, and they went lowest to highest to find the cheapest options. On the other hand, the people who landed on that cloud sorted more often than not their car or the, the, the products by customer rating, which often led them to purchasing more expensive furniture. So it actually increased their bottom line by, by split testing this and figuring out that the clouds put people into a different frame of mind. And so absolute must read for any marketer out there, uh, uh, pre suasion. It talks about how we're manipulated before we even get to a thing and how to deploy that in uh, your own marketing and, and the way that your brands go. So it's not so much that these brands don't care about you. It's actually that they care a lot about you. And now here's the interesting part of this. You tie all of that in with developing uh, a customer experience that is remarkable. By definition, remarkable means that it was something is so good or awe-inspiring or awesome that you must share it with somebody else. You must comment on it or remark about it elsewhere. So how do you create an experience with your business or your brand that is so good people will talk about it? And that's what I try to do when I get into a business is look at all of the different avenues of how, uh, A, right from the very beginning, how are you attracting customers? How are you bringing people into your world? B, once they get there, what happens to them? C, if you do have a process to guide them along, what does that process look like? How efficient is it? How can you make it more memorable and add more to it? And then finally, when they get to the end of it, how do you over deliver again so that they are re continuously reminded about how amazing that experience was? So they talk about it more and they become a return customer or they become an advocate for you and your brand. So that's that's the kind of the definition of like what I do when I when I work out a customer experience path for a business. Okay, good. I want to agree with you, but I don't. Okay. Because I have worked with corporations historically and um, it was quite a long time ago, but I never failed to be amazed or astounded at how shit they were. <laughs> <laughs> like how little thought can I tell you this yeah so about 20 years ago I was involved in selling large-scale IT solutions to um, banks and insurance companies and one of the things that they were concerned about was their legacy systems so basically what happened at that stage is they'd been producing code to drive like applications in their business for 30 or 40 years and nobody had a clue what this code was doing. Like, literally, nobody had a clue. And so the idea was, this thing had just become too cumbersome. So they'd produced the code, it had never been documented, 
Um, so basically nobody knew what was going on. So the situation that they were in at this stage, and I'd be surprised if it's changed dramatically now, is basically they had systems that were completely unmanageable, completely inefficient, completely unmanageable. So what they were trying to do is reverse engineer those systems so that they could have something that works, but that was documented or was managed. Now, I happen to know, because I was working with coders, is that still nothing was getting documented. Like, we were <laughs> supposedly addressing this issue, but we weren't addressing this issue. So so it's appalling. Um, the reason I don't believe what you're saying, that this is happening by design, is because I might phone up with a really simple thing. Like, I've lost my card. But by the time it's taken me an hour and 15 minutes to get it sorted, because I held for eight minutes, and then the call got dropped, and then I got through to somebody and they didn't want to do their job. Or they hung up on me or whatever it was. By the time I'm an hour and 15 minutes into this thing, I am steaming. Do you know what I mean? I am absolutely raging and I'm going to go to war. And, you know, when you speak to a customer service people and they say, oh, there's not a manager available and they just refuse to escalate your call. The, this, so the process isn't about calming me down because something has happened that, that I'm enraged. Nothing's going to happen that, like, if, if they came around and ran over my cat, I'd be enraged. Like, keeping me on the phone for 10 minutes to calm down might make sense in that instance. But nothing's going on with my bank that is enraging until I have to engage with them. And it's the actual process of engaging with them that upsets me. So very often, like I've learned, um, you can't display that rage. But very often, the words that I, the first words I'll say when a customer service person answers the phone is, I'm really sorry, I'm in a really bad mood because I am 45 minutes into this already. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, because I'm cynical, like you know, because I'm on this conspiracy scale, like you know, I just think, I just think, here's what I actually think, is that the profit isn't, attached to the level of service that you provide and that's why because if it was because if they saw that they were losing this many customers and it was costing this amount of money and even if they are losing this amount of customers it's costing this amount of money they're gaining these other customers and they're making this kind of that's the calculation that's going on i think not about how can we create a remarkable um customer experience for our customers the other thing i want to say is that reverse psychology is probably more powerful. So what I wonder also is if there is some value for them in pushing people away and pushing them a bit harder. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost Cre like creating intentional friction. <laughs> yeah. So literally it took an hour and a half, but I'm so relieved that it's done that I'm not going to go to the ombudsman to complain. Do you know what I mean? Because at least it's done. And it might be yeah, another six months before I have Stockholm to engage with syndrome. Them. What's that? <laughs> See, now it's a light form of Stockholm syndrome. And it held you is. hostage for an hour and a half, and you're just so thankful that it's finally over. Yeah. Well, now I can go yeah. back and do the thing I was supposed to be doing an hour and a half ago. But yeah. well, and, and this is this. Is, it's really great that you're you're shedding a light on this, and I I, th I do ha I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. Sure, there are some some outlying businesses who are who have bad business practices no. and who are disconnected from uh, their customers and their audience, right? There are definitely brands, even big ones uh, out there that just don't, they're missing the mark. And this is why uh, I'm trying to think of some brands that are a little bit more global here, but, but perhaps I'm a little bit too close here, but brands like Zeller's, they, they're gone. They lost touch. Hudson's Bay Company, the, the like the founding department store of our country is gone out of business. Sears, they, they're gone. They, they didn't adapt to the markets in the way that people expect business to be done. And, and that's what happens. I'm a, I'm a very true uh, uh, advocate of people voting with their own dollars. At some point, you will be upset enough that maybe you just won't bank with that bank anymore. And banks are a really, really hard uh, example to use just because of how deep and fundamental they are in our society and the way that we collectively function. They can get away with the, the horrible, horrible things that they do. But somebody like Walmart, as an example, 
I think is a little bit more in touch with the people that they're serving in that uh, they recognize issues and they do their best to solve it. Do they solve every problem? No, definitely not. Because there are too many problems. And if you try to make everybody happy, you're going to make nobody happy. So that also does point at another really, really big fundamental part of marketing, which is know thy people. You have to know who you're trying to serve. And and this can be, the argument can be made with, with Gary Vaynerchuk as an example. Gary Vaynerchuk is a very polarizing gentleman. On one hand, I think he's intelligent and and bright and creative and driven and passionate and all those other really wonderful buzzwords. On the other hand, I think he's abrasive. I think that he can be rude. I think that he says the F word far too many times <laughs> in one minute bursts for most people to understand. But here's the thing. He's not for everybody. And, and if you want to attract everybody, what you're going to end up doing is isolating yourself because you actually don't attract anyone. The people that you do want to work with don't want to work with you because you're too vanilla. You're not my kind of people. You're too soft. I need somebody like Gary who can scream and yell and get shit done. I need somebody like Grant Cardone who I was watching one of his videos right before bed, which I do not recommend anybody does. Do not watch Grant Cardone before bed. He will make you anxious. Uh, but he's, again, he's not everybody's cup of tea. And so, um, when you think about customer experience, that's one of the things that you got to factor in. There's a restaurant that just popped up recently. I don't know if you saw this on TikTok. It's called the Karens or something like that. And the whole part purpose of this restaurant to exist is that they, they tell every one of their staff to be as rude and offensive as possible. And the video that I saw was, they were bringing like their unsuspecting friend in like three or four people already knew what this restaurant was about, but the one person had no idea. And so like the, the hostess at the front, uh, looked at everybody and then was like, what do you want? It's like, Oh, uh, and she was like really taken aback by that. We're, we're here for our reservation. And she's like, yeah, well go sit the F down. <laughs> Just a completely rude to her. And then the, the server comes over and uh, like gives the finger to the guy doing the video, like he's videotaping this to show her his friend's reaction. And the whole restaurant is designed to insult you and swear at you and make you feel like shit. And they're busy. The whole place was packed. They got reservations for the next few months because it's a weird and outlandish experience. Is it for everybody? No. I guarantee you if my grandma went there, she'd have a heart attack, man. But there are some people who just want to go for that kind of, how insulting can these people be? You know, some people yeah. will go to a Dave Chappelle co uh, uh, comedy show and absolutely love it. Other people will totally bag on him on social media and call him the worst thing since Hitler. Yeah. So no, knowing that customer is, I think, a, re a really important part. But again, yeah, banks and, and, and large, large, large corporations like that, I'm sure there are a ton of outliers that are just so far, far disconnected from their customers, which again points back at why it's so important for you to build that community around your brand, for, that, for you to be able to communicate closely with them and design a customer experience that makes sense for the way that you want to serve people. Okay, good. I mean, the the only thing I think is, I think, and, and this is a glimmer of hope for me, is because I don't think they're outliers. I think corporations have got really, really bad at providing anything like a reasonable customer experience. And even my favorite brands like Apple, I've been an Apple customer for 14 years. I remember the one decent customer experience I've had with them. Do you know what I mean? And they are supposed to be driving it. So I don't think they're outliers. And I think there's hope for us as small businesses that corporations, and God knows we need it to happen, is that corporations are too far removed from their customers and they are going to lose customers. And hopefully there'll be opportunities for us. Okay, we've been going long. We've been going for an hour and 15 minutes already. And I know you've got somewhere else to be in 15 minutes time. So we need to march on with the format. I think the good news, do you want the good news? Yeah, fire away. I think you are um, perfectly qualified to talk to us about customer experience and growth hacking. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Uh, the second question was, who do you work with? How do you add value? You've kind of given us a sense of that. 
but maybe you can tell us maybe in a minute or two what it is that your ideal customer looks like and what you might uh, the value you might be able to deliver for them so i'm going to shoot myself in the foot here uh in saying there is a sustainable content model that lends to developing a community and an audience of people around you for pretty much any and every industry that's out there and you can't serve them all so the the two areas that i know for for uh, an absolute fact that are in dire need of this just because of the state of the collective industry <laughs> is uh, lawyers and uh, car dealerships. And the reason I say lawyers and car dealerships is because these are the two most uh, worst talked about industries that exist. And I love a challenge. I love a challenge. So being able to rehumanize uh, the legal profession or car sales, rehumanize it, reconnect the people with the, uh, the, the customers that they're trying to serve in a more meaningful way, I think is, uh, where I fit best. And just so happens that, that that's been, uh, the majority of my clients is, have either been legal real estate kind of world or, uh, in car sales. Okay. So it sounds like you're snide uncles, doesn't it? You got a snide uncle who's a estate agent, a snide uncle who's a used car dealer, and a snide uncle yeah. who's a lawyer. Um, okay, cool. So that makes sense. And then you apply the things that you've been talking to us about already. Okay. So the next question then is, what is your recommendation for people who want to get better at customer experience and growth hacking? Be very, very simple about it. Take everything away that you possibly can take away before it falls apart and here's the perfect example of this you know when you're walking around sam's club or costco or whatever the uh, wholesale club is in in your country uh and there's those little kiosks and they're always handing out something there's a free cinnamon bun on a toothpick or a sausage or something and they got it there for you and they're not asking anything from you they just hand it to you and then you eat it and then you march off and you're like, ha ha, I showed them I got a free cinnamon bun. And then you circle back around the aisle and then you go and grab that thing because it was so good that you just had to have more. That's the customer experience. And, and then make your product or the way that you serve people so good that the next time that they're there, they need it. They crave it. They want it. They, they, they desire it. And how that looks in a variety of different industries is a very different thing. Um, but you got to put people first. You got to get back to that idea that you are here serving people and numbers are inevitable. If you serve enough people, you'll make enough money. And hopefully you have a product or an innovation or a design or a service that can serve many, many people. And there are different business models for different service things and, and that you can use to scale up and, and do whatever. But, but really, you got to think about the people, put the people first. And then once you do that, you'll be able to follow where they go and how they interact with your business. And, and if you're not documenting it, you're not going to even, see, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see any of the growth. You're not going to see any of the measurables that are seemingly intangible uh, unless you pay attention. So you got to start at that first thing. What can you give somebody that will make them want to work with you or do business with you or purchase your product or, uh, interact with your business in some way. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Good. Okay, so we're at question number four. Um, question number four, what should people read? You've already recommended a couple of things. Is there something that, is there anything else that people should read? Uh, if you're trying to transition your business into the online space and you haven't been there before, uh, .com Secrets by Russell Brunson is literally the bible it is the whole thing that you will ev everything you ever need is in that book it's a matter of execution and if you don't have the skills to execute on it you can find the right people um but then he has a trilogy of things that follow that up depending on you know the industry or space that you're in so if you do coaching or consulting or service based type things um expert secrets is a gr really great uh book for that space that ties into dotcom secrets and then if you're trying to scale things up and you've already kind of been in that world uh, Traffic Secrets is another really great uh, book. So I, I would fully recommend the Russell Brunson trilogy. Super cool. Excellent. Okay, good. So that brings us to question number five. Who can you throw under the bus? Firstly, we need to check in and see how your experience has been 
have you enjoyed the experience of being on the talk marketing show absolutely i I tend to ramble and and drove on when I get really passionate about a certain subject. And for us to have passed as much time as we did here, I can definitely say I enjoyed doing that. Okay, um, in cool. terms of who, who, who I would throw under the bus to have on here, uh, I was thinking about this right from the very beginning. And there's a number of people that I've talked to over the ages that I think would be a really, really great fit for this. Um, so forgive me for not saying... Uh, 300 names here. Uh, but the one that really jumps out at me is Kobe Simmet. And he really talks about, no. um, no, you haven't heard of him. I have heard of him. He introduced me to Mitch who introduced me to you. Oh no, he's been on the show. He's been on the show already. Yeah. And it's brilliant. It's coming up in the next week or two. I think it will go live. So, awesome. Um, okay. Well, that was a so great conversation, a really good conversation. So, okay, so I need another uh, unsuspecting victim here. Ideally, you uh, need two, but what's the thing? He also raved about you guys, just so you know. Oh, does he? That's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter Hopwood, he is another really great guy. Um, he goes into storytelling and um, communicating your message. And he's more specifically, you know, TED, TEDx, TED Talk kind of coaching. Um, but underlying the specific purpose of him uh, teaching you storytelling, there is a lot to learn in the vein of if you're trying to communicate your brand with people, understanding how to tell a good story, he'll help you uh, lock that in for sure. So that's a that's one guy I think that would be a good fit. Yeah, let me think of somebody else here. Let's go with... Uh, Stephen Vetter. He's a very close friend of mine who, uh, he's going to hate me for saying this, but he accidentally fell into uh, owning some, some car dealerships and has done really, really well for himself. Um, but, but he knows people very, very well. And, uh, and sales is, is kind of his, the, the backbone to, to, to what he does, but, but he does it in a, very humanized way and uh i still to this day even though we've been friends for a, for a number of years i still to this day don't have one conversation with him where i don't learn something so he'd be another really really great contributor to the show brilliant you're an absolute legend thank you very much so if you are able to put together like a little linkedin kind of intro um in the way that mitch did then um then i'll pick it up from there that will be absolutely amazing brother i have loved this conversation You've actually challenged me a little bit, like because I quite enjoy to ask, ask ask challenging questions. But yeah, you're you've got me thinking differently about maybe the way these things are working, which is not something that happens in every conversation I have, because I'm stubborn and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel um, that pain. Yeah. So what we'll do now then is we'll say goodbye um, for anyone who is watching this far. And then what I'll do is I'll stop the recording. And we'll say goodbye like normal human beings. But man, thank you so much for agreeing to be here today. I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I've learned stuff and I'm thinking about stuff. And like I say, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, man. I, I appreciate you giving me a place to rant on as I have. So thank you so much for having me on. You are very welcome.